All right, welcome back everyone. Hope you guys all had a great week and I hope you guys enjoyed uh, last week's video uh, talking about uh, Israel and Egypt and why they even you know went down there in the first place. If you didn't, didn't get a chance to check out that video, you know after this one, just scroll a little bit on down and you'll see it you know down on our Facebook page. So, um, but uh, to, to move on to this week's message, if any of you guys know my wife at all, you know that she is just a bargain hunter. She loves, you know, she's all over Facebook's buy, sell, trade, um, you know, thrift stores, uh, garage sales, anything like that. She is all about it. And one of her favorite places is Goodwill. And from time to time, I do go with her. And it wasn't uh, too long ago that I was with her and I came across uh, the book series here, uh, the Left Behind series. And uh, when I was a kid, I actually went through the children's uh, version of this, but had never actually gone through this series. They had almost every one of the books at this Goodwill, and they're like 99 cents. So I snagged them up, tracked down the other few that I was missing, and just like cruised through these book series. It was super, super fun. Uh, but for those of you that don't know, uh, the Left Behind series um, is... Uh, it's a series of 16 best-selling uh, religious novels by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins dealing with the Christian dispensationalists of end times. The pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, Christian eschatological interpretation of the biblical apocalypse. That is a lot of really big, fancy words. Um, I pulled that directly from their Wikipedia page. Um, basically, it is a... Um, book series over you know the the coming time of the tribulation um but um this this uh i guess summary of the book series talks a lot about what i want to talk about today so i thought it was just a good intro into today's message well we are going to be talking about eschatology now um, i know that that is in and of itself a big and fancy word that most of you probably uh, don't know and so uh, here's the definition pulled from the dictionary it is a branch of theology concerned with the final events in history of the world or of humankind uh, which still is a great definition because i think it's a little wordy and a little hard to understand so when we just kind of break down the word obviously it ends with ology so we know that it is the study of something um, and when we look at the first half of that word eschatos uh, means uh, last in reference to time so it is you know the study of end times is what eschatology is and that is going to be what the focus of today's messages. And we're gonna just kind of break it up into a couple of different sections. First, we're gonna talk about the idea of dispensationalism. And I know that that is, you know, probably another new big and fancy word that maybe you're not familiar with. We'll get to that here in a little bit. But then after that, we are going to talk about just some of the signs of the uh, end times. Um, but one thing that I did just kind of want to just warn and caution of is that we are not going to be getting into like any sort of like predictions of the date or, you know, this is when it's going to happen, anything like that. The Bible is extremely clear. Matthew 24 verse 36 says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. So we are not going to get into any sort of prediction of, you know, this is when it's going to happen or anything like that. All that that you might hear out there, that is just, you know, really nonsense and people just making their best guesses. So first things first, dispensationalism. Uh, the definition is, uh, it's the idea of biblical history is divided by God into defined periods of times or ages to which God has allotted distinctive administrative principles. Now, again, this definition doesn't really tell us too much just because it's, it, I think it's a little hard to understand. So it's really, um, my definition, I guess I would say, is, is it's the idea that God has established different periods or ages of time all throughout human history. Again, that means past, present, and future to serve a specific purpose for him. And it's important to note, and I think this helps us when we read the Bible, that you know, throughout these different periods of time, um, God interacts with you know, humans and with um, believers and everyone a little differently than he does you know, in a different time. When we read through the Old Testament, we see um, you know, 
demon possession and you know this wrath uh, the wrath and the wars and god uh, the, the plagues, things like that. And we don't see that necessarily today. Well, that's just because, you know, we're in a, a different age of time. And so God uh, has a different purpose for this time. And so he acts a little differently. So um, I think the best way to just uh, understand the idea of dispensationalism is to just kind of look at a timeline of these different uh, periods of times or ages. And it really goes all the way back to the beginning with the fall of man. You know, at creation, um, God, um, obviously, he created man, and he created us to rule over um, all of his creation. Um, he, it was his system. We had it his way. Things were perfect. Then the serpent came along and obviously deceived us. And um, man, Adam and Eve, basically told God, yeah, you know, your way is pretty good, but we want to try it our way. And so God steps back and says, okay, you want to have it your way? Have at it. And then so we have the age of man. And not, we don't know a lot about this time period. Um, the Bible doesn't dive into it very much at all. But we obviously know that it was an incredibly wicked period of time. So much so that God basically has to hit the virtual reset button with the flood. Um, so things get so bad when man is just left to themselves and having it their way that God has to hit the reset button and um, he decides to, you know, intervene just a little bit more. You know, man left to themselves, having it their way completely doesn't go so well. So he uh, makes a covenant with Abraham, a promise that he is going to create a nation out of Abraham. And this nation will be a blessing into the entire world. And we know that the fulfillment of that covenant is uh, with um, the nation of Israel. And so we have the age of the Jews. And that, this is what the bulk of what the Old Testament is all about. When we read through that, this is what the, you know, the focus really is, is this time period. Um, but again, we know how that ends not very well. Rather than the Jews being a light to the world and bringing the world to God, um, the world kind of you know, drags them back down. And it ends with you know, the death and resurrection ascension of their own Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ. So after the age of the Jews, we see that we, we have Pentecost occurs and we enter into where we are at currently today, uh, the church age. I'm sure some of you guys have, uh, you know, heard this um, phrase or idea that we are in the church age. Um, so God left man by themselves, didn't go so well, intervened a little bit more by creating a nation to be a light in the world, didn't go so well. So he intervenes even a little bit more. And has a group of people that have chosen to follow God, and he gives them um, his own Holy Spirit. And yet we still see that that is not going too well. When we look at the world today, you know, how's the church doing? Is, is the world turning to God? More and more we're seeing that the, that the church is turning and going back towards the world. So the next thing that we see, um, and it's a a little controversial, we'll get into a little bit more, but it's uh, the rapture. And you'll see that I have two arrows here, one right at uh, right before this next event and one right after. And now don't be confused to think that there are you know two raptures or anything like that, but we're now shifting to, um, rather than talking about things that have occurred in the past, we're now gonna be talking about future events. The rapture is a future event. And with that, you know, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. We do have a little bit of interpreting that we have to do on our own. And so I have two arrows here just because, you know, there are some people that believe the rapture will happen right before this next event, and some believe it will happen right after. And we'll get into that a little bit more uh, here in a few minutes, but just wanted to throw that out there for now. But then, so right after the church age, the church age kind of ends with uh, the signing of the treaty with Israel and the nations. And the moment that this treaty is signed, it starts a seven year ticking time bomb known as the tribulation. This is the next age. It is considerably shorter than the rest of them. You know, we have a few thousand years for the age of man, age of Jews, for the church age. And the tribulation is only seven years long. And this is really a time that God has kind of two purposes, to be honest with you. One, it is to kind of get things right with Israel and bring Israel back into the picture. God made a promise with Abraham and even with David. And 
when God makes a promise, he keeps it. <laughs> and so he is bringing them back and bringing the Jews, bringing Israel back in to get them right so he can fulfill his promise that he made. Um, but the tribulation also serves um, as a time for God to just pour out his wrath on this world for the wrongs that they have done to him and to his people, to the nation of Israel, to um, his bride, the church. And so God pours out his wrath on the earth during this time. While it is the shortest um, age, it is far and away also the worst age that we'll see. Literally billions of people will die during this time. In the tribulation, like I said, it's seven years long. It ends with Armageddon, with uh, Christ returning from heaven with his army. And he comes back and makes war against the beast and his army. Uh, and I use the term makes war relatively loosely because it's not so much of a war as much as it's a slaughter. Christ comes back, basically takes control of this world and enters us into the thousand year reign known as the millennium. Uh, where Christ will literally be here on earth reigning for a thousand years. During this time period, Satan is bound up and locked away, so he has no influence at all during this time. Um, while I said the tribulation was the worst time in human history, this millennium will, is definitely the best part of human history up until this point of time, obviously. Um, uh, like I said, Christ literally will be reigning physically here on earth. Um, it will be an incredible time. Uh, the Bible talks about how, um, you know, the man who lives to be a hundred years old will be considered cursed. I mean, so life is going to be great during this time under the rule of Christ. Unfortunately, it doesn't end here. Um, we see that after this thousand years, Satan is released and he immediately gathers an army um, it's, uh, and tries to you know, overthrow Christ and his kingdom again. This is known as the Battle of Gog and Magog. Again, this occurs right at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. And it's really at this point um, that God has kind of proven his point. Um, the, Satan gathers this army. They go to you know, try to overthrow Christ, and fire comes down from heaven wipes out the army in an instant. Uh, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. And God can now basically stand back and say, okay, enough is enough. I have given you guys every opportunity to try to prove and show me that there's any other way to do this. He let man be by themselves. Didn't work. He intervened a little bit with the nation of Israel, didn't work. Intervened a little bit more with the church, didn't work. Intervened a lot with the millennial kingdom of Christ here on earth, and yet there still was rebellion. So at this point in time, God can definitively say, there is no other way. It's only my way. And so um, I believe it's in either first or second Peter, we see that he kind of like sets fire to this world and we have a new heavens and a new earth that are created. And we enter into the last age, a last period of time known as the eternal state. And this is kind of the idea of when we think of heaven, this is it. Um, obviously we are, um, we were created to be on earth. Um, all the way back at the creation before the fall of man. That's what we were created for. And that's what it will be in the end is we will have our eternal state back in God's system, back in the way that God wanted it on a new heavens and with a new earth. Um, and things will be um, as God wanted them. So there's um, just kind of a quick uh, overview and recap of everything that we talked about there. Um, there are other people that if like you were really to talk to a Bible scholar, that their ideas might differ a little bit from what I have. They might have one or two other key events in there. But for the most part, you know, this is a, a really good introduction and overview of the idea of dispensationalism. So next, we're going to talk about uh, the signs of the end times. Um, the, the first section that we're going to talk about here um, are just some, some key passages. We're just going to briefly mention them just so that you're aware of them, uh, but we're not going to dive too much into them just because each one of these passages could probably be a lesson within itself. Uh, so the first one we have Matthew 24, uh, is actually should read uh, verses 5 through 7. And in that uh, passage, it talks about how there will be wars, famines, and earthquakes, and how those are signs of the end times. Uh, now, we'll, uh, then after that, we follow it up in 1 Thessalonians, 
uh, five verses one through three, it talks about um, this idea of peace and safety. And now, you know, I, I look at those two things. Matthew 24 talks about how there will be wars. First Thessalonians talks about how there will be peace and safety. How do you really reconcile those two things? I'm not positive. Um, one I, potential idea could be that, you know, there could be wars, famines, and earthquakes, similar to like what we have going on in today's world. And then this, um, the, the man of sin, the beast, kind of steps up with this idea of peace and safety. And that's how he introduces um, the treaty. And we enter into the tribulation. I'm not saying that's how it will play out, but that is just an idea. And those are definitely signs of the end times. Uh, the last one that we have here is 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, verses 1 through 3. And it, um, that passage discusses the great apostasy, which is the idea that uh, there will be a great falling away of, uh, within the church uh, from the faith, um, and, that, and that that is a sign of the end times. And again, I'm not saying that we are currently in the great apostasy or anything like that, but I think when you look at you know, recent history of the church, go back 50 years and compare to what we look like today compared to then, I think an argument could, could be made that at least there's, you know, a, a, a shadow, a glimmer of this apostasy that is being uh, discussed about in Second Thessalonians. So those are just a few passages that I wanted to um, just briefly mention and just uh, make you aware of, of, of these being potential signs of the end times. Um, but lastly, I want to talk about uh, three more things a little bit more in-depthly um, as potential signs again. And uh, previously, I, I had mentioned the rapture. And when I brought it up on that dispensation uh, timeline, I had an arrow that was right before, you know, uh, the, the tribulation and one that was like right after the tribulation. And the reason why I had both of them there is, you know, up until probably just a couple of years ago, I had always believed that the rapture would happen right before the tribulation, that the rapture would occur. And then maybe through the chaos of the rapture, that would kind of spark the treaty or, you know, who knows, maybe simultaneous or I don't know. But I had always been of the idea that the rapture was right before the tribulation. Um, but a few years ago, I was, you know, reading and I was studying in, in Revelation chapter six. And um, in chapter six, we have the introduction of kind of like the, the wrath of God being poured out in the tribulation and is discussing the seals. And the first seal is the white rider. Um, uh, the white rider is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware of that, even from, you know, pop culture, the, the four horsemen are, are pretty popular. Um, but the, the white rider is addressed in Revelation uh, 6, uh, verse 2. And so it says here, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He, he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering to conquer. So when you really break down and start to look into who this white rider is, um, it, it's pretty clear that we can establish that the white rider is uh, Jesus. There's other references in the Old Testament of the four horsemen. Um, I believe in Jeremiah and a few other places that we, we can definitively and pretty clearly identify the white rider as Christ. And when I was looking at that, so if, if Jesus is coming you know, in on a horse and it says that he is conquering to conquer, I was just kind of um, confused, I guess, by that. It's like, what, what does that mean? What, what is his conquest? Because obviously we know that Jesus does have you know, final conquest in the end at Armageddon when he comes back. But we're talking about the very first seal here. What is Jesus' conquest at the beginning of the tribulation? And I really didn't, couldn't find a good answer for it. The only thing that I could kind of come up with, and I actually went on to find that there are, you know, quite a few other people out there as well that believe this. Um, but it's the idea that, uh, that Christ comes back to rescue his bride um, from, from the enemy and from the, the tribulation and wrath that is about to be poured out on this entire world, that that is his conquest, that Jesus comes and snatches, um, again, his bride away from the enemy. That, that made a lot of sense to me. I, I couldn't find any other way how to interpret uh, Jesus' conquest at the beginning 
other than the potential rapture. Um, and so that's where this um, fits in as a sign of the end times. If the rapture happens after the signing of the treaty, that means that there will be believers present when the treaty is signed. And there will hopefully be watchful believers that are able to identify what is going on. And they'll be able to point to, hey, look what's going on. And they'll know exactly what that means and that that seven-year time bomb that we talked about just started ticking. And while we always should have, you know, an urgency to, to share the message of life with unbelievers, this should, you know, magnify that by, you know, a million times because we know that our time as believers here on earth is extremely limited and we know what is about to happen to the rest of this world here. So um, if the rapture does occur, like I, I do believe, uh, if it happens after the treaty, the treaty itself would serve as a sign of end times. Now, I do still firmly believe, like I talked about in Matthew 24, 36, no one knows the day or hour of his return just because the rapture happens after um, the, the treaty does not mean that we would know exactly when the rapture will happen. It could happen again almost simultaneously with the treaty. It could happen hours, days, potentially even weeks after the treaty, the rapture could happen. Um, I, I don't know. I just know that that would definitely be a sign of end times. So next we have the idea of Babylon. When we read through the book of Revelation, we see a lot of different mentions um, of Babylon. And when we look around at the world today, there is no Babylon. So a lot of people, you just tend to assume that this idea is, it's symbolic, that Babylon represents something else that will, you know, whether some people have thought maybe Russia or, or who knows what else um, represents Babylon, which to be fair, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say that it's not symbolic. However, at the same time, um, a hundred years ago, people reading through the book of Revelation were reading about Israel, and they thought the same thing about Israel. There was no Israel. Is they thought Israel was symbolic. They they believed that the church had symbolically replaced um, Israel. Obviously, now today we have you know revisionist history, and we can see that um, clearly Israel has been reestablished as a nation, and that it's not symbolic. So I believe that this could definitely be the case with Babylon. Uh, that, uh, in fact, that's that's definitely the way that I lean to, to believe is that Babylon will need to be reestablished um, for um, these prophetic um, events to occur. Uh, now, I, I mentioned uh, the Left Behind series at the start of this video, and the way that they kind of um, worked around this idea was that the man of sin, the beast, after he kind of took control and took power, he recreated Babylon and made it the world capital. And so it's the idea that, um, that Babylon could be recreate, recreated post-treaty or during the tribulation. And I think that this is definitely, you know, a, a possible um, outcome as well. So um, it's not necessary that Babylon has to be recreated, you know, for end times to occur. However, if we do see the recreation of Babylon, I think that definitely does serve as a um, sign of the end times. And kind of similar to that, uh, to the idea of Babylon is the temple. Um, if, if you ever have read through uh, the book of Daniel, we see that in his 70th week prophecy, the idea of the abomination of desolation. And that is um, the beast goes into the temple. He kind of mirrors uh, something that happened you know, a couple thousand years ago with Antiochus Epiphanes, who went into the temple in Israel and uh, he uh, slaughtered and sacrificed a pig to Zeus um, in the temple. Obviously, um, an incredible uh, travesty. And the beast in the tribulation will kind of mirror that and do um, something very, very similar. Um, more than likely, he will probably make a sacrifice to Satan. Um, however, the idea still stands that there needs to be a temple. And when we look around, obviously we know that the temple was destroyed by Rome in AD 70. So what temple? And so uh, similar to the idea of Babylon, uh, where it, it, it could potentially happen post-treaty. Um, in fact, I think I could see that playing out very well, where um, this uh, 
the man of sin kind of comes together with Israel and makes a treaty with them to promise them that they will be able to build their temple um, through the treaty. I, I think that that is a very potentially likely, um, you know, possibility. But at the same time, if we do see the reconstruction of the temple, that is a sign of end times. In fact, I know that Israel, the nation, has kind of plans in place to rebuild the temple. It's just that I don't think they currently, you know, own or have access to the land that they need to build the temple. Um, so could it happen during the tribulation? Absolutely. But it doesn't need to. And if it does happen before then, that is definitely a sign of the end times. So that's basically everything that I have here for you today. I know that that was a lot of information, a lot of really heavy information, and you probably have a million questions. Um, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out. Write any questions, comments, or concerns you have below. I'd be more than happy to get to any and all of those and elaborate on any of my thoughts. And if you think I'm wrong, please tell me. <laughs> I would love nothing more than to know truth. I don't want to be right. I want to know um, what is true. So let me know if you have questions or anything like that. Otherwise, um, this will probably be uh, my last video for a little while. Um, next week is Mother's Day, so uh, no video, taking the week off for that. And then after that, we're going to be meeting in person. So no, no more videos. But I hope you guys all have great weeks, and I will see you soon. Bye.